so uh, I, it's super great to be here. I, um, we're we're going to have a conversation mostly uh, about the things we were discussing today, which was really invigorating, which is a whole host of topics that deal with um, design and the power of the human imagination and the ability to work on intractable problems. So uh, you know, a lot of the projects that we do uh, are, are just that. Uh, we don't take on work that uh, we solve within a year or so. I know there's a lot of millennials, especially my students, that want to sort of get into the business world very quickly, create some kind of an app, make a ton of money, and get out and retire and do something else. And, and, and uh, you know, maybe that's just in America, I, I don't know. We have the sense of immediacy and uh, affluenza there that, that's um, a, a bit of a sickness. The problems that we work on um, take years to solve. And uh, some of them uh, may never actually come to fruition. Uh, very recently, we've decided to uh, focus our work, uh, which is mostly uh, about cities, uh, onto one specific aspect that I think uh, affects, affects us all, and certainly myself, the most. Um, and I'll start with a little bit of a story, but it's, essentially it's about extinction. And uh, the problem with extinction is that we are erasing things off the face of the earth, uh, every seven minutes. So I don't know how many creatures uh, will disappear during the course of this talk, but every seven minutes you can count down and expect something else to disappear forever. And I know uh, with the problems that we have today with immigration and all sorts of uh, conflict zones and refugees and, and the things that humanity is struggling to just get right between ourselves, uh, it's just unbelievable that we it takes an extra bit of, uh, of thinking to realize that we're wiping out things that don't even have a voice, that can't use Twitter to say, uh, help me, or something to that effect. And that we are, um, I, I would say we, meaning the profession of architecture, urban design, and planning, are, are very much complicit uh, in wiping out these species because of all the development that we're doing. And so we wanted to uh, retool our nonprofit to think about this impossible promise, which is ending extinction by all means possible. And how could we do that? So our, our projects uh, are, are large in scale. They, they tackle this wicked problem. And the endeavor, I think, is not something that we're going to solve on our own. In fact, if we do end extinction, you won't be able to credit any single individual. It won't be a top-down movement from some government. It won't be a specific leader or leadership. It won't be a grassroots movement. Uh, it won't be a, you know, a soccer mom and dad. It won't be some kid. It'll probably be essentially all of us doing something, uh, certainly being aware of it and communicating it to stop it. Uh, a good example might be the uh, nuclear proliferation of weaponry that we had in the 80s. Uh, everyone started thinking about that equation, which was, hmm, if we continue the buildup between the United States and Russia, the two superpowers, or the Soviets really, uh, you know, eventually we'll perhaps accidentally create this nuclear holocaust, some kind of Armageddon. And so much money was invested in it, and it just seemed futile to everyone involved. No one wanted to really do this. We kept on doing it, but people felt, like we do now, powerless to stop an, a gargantuan problem. And at the end, we, we still haven't uh, been annihilated by nuclear destruction. We're doing really good under Obama for a bit there. Uh, the scales are tipping again with our current leader. Uh, I guess I'll apologize a second time <laughs> for that. Uh, who knows what will happen. But, uh, you know, the, we, we stopped with the proliferation of that, those kinds of weaponry. Uh, we, we have a UN organization that's as strong as it could be, and we're working very hard. I think all of us, those are soccer mom and dads, those are big people in government. Those are large-scale organizations to stop this. So when it comes to something like extinction, uh, we can do it. We just need to do our part. Uh, and we define that uh, through design and through the power of imagination. We think about a world where we don't wipe out a species every seven minutes. Uh, I also don't like uh, essentially coming up here and talking about very dark, gloomy, maudlin topics such as everything dying all the time. Uh, that's, that's not normally my my perspective. But recently, we've had this sense of incredible urgency. It just seems to be accelerating too fast. And I have two daughters. Uh, one is five, one is nine. And they're, they're not going to see a lot of these species that are out there that I've 
seen my entire life. Um, one thing we looked at particularly, something known as the monarch butterfly. It's this beautiful orange butterfly. And for those of you who know anything about butterflies, it's one of the most fantastic creatures you can ever see visually. Uh, insects in general are disappearing. Actually, birds, fish, mammals, plant life, and insects, we've lost half of everything since the 70s. So it's all gone. If, uh, I don't know what it's like to drive around Ireland, but when you're driving in uh, upstate New York, or actually a recent article in Germany, uh, people would drive around in their cars, and there used to be tons of dead bugs on those German vehicles on the Autobahn. And they would be on the license plate, the headlights, all over the windshield, uh, and that's disappearing. In fact, the Germans even have these special license plates that are just grids, and they would kill a bunch of bugs, and then the, the citizen scientist or, or, or an entomologist would look and start graphing what bugs they had killed by just simply driving. And today, now that you drive on the Autobahn, you almost see nothing. So you might get one or two bugs if you're lucky on your license plate, not thousands that you used to get. And that's due to a lot of things, pesticides and herbicides, overdevelopment, other species dying off, uh, different types of predation mechanisms that don't work in, in, in those uh, landscape conditions, uh, and mostly the kind of this, the products that we all use, and we're aware of it. And this is affecting something like the monarch. Uh, so we decided, you know, we gotta, we, let's solve one thing first, let's do that well, and then from that point of departure, let's have other people join in and work on stopping extinction. So the monarch butterfly, uh, I guess, is disappearing. You can find out more specifically why that's happening. And you can also look up other things, which I'm sure you heard about, colony collapse disorder with bees. Uh, we're losing bees everywhere. And the, those pollinate what? Our farms and our food. Something like 30% of all the crops on this planet could disappear if we lose bees. And a lot more, probably. Just the idea that we would lose bees just doesn't, I can't even fathom that. I don't know how anyone else could. Uh, but if we're not interested in saving the bees, maybe we'll work on something even more aesthetically pleasing. If we have to brand it, it would be the monarch. So we, we had a building uh, in New York City. We had a, a very wealthy client came to us to do a project next to Prada in Soho. And uh, he, he had a commercial space and wanted some eight-story structure, blah, 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 something to that effect. And I, we said very politely, we don't do that work, please go away. There's lots of other architects that would be happy to do that. It's not our mission to create another brick lump that's a commercial space. Uh, and they said, no, we're having problems with our community board. Uh, they don't want this building there, and they want to do something that's super green. And that's why we came to you guys. So are you interested in doing that? Uh, we said, sure, as long as you're earnest and that you're not interested in greenwashing, uh, but we'll give you something that's as green as we can think of. Um, so that's where this project called, uh, it's a Lepidopterium, or a Lepidopterterium. Uh, Lepidopter is, uh, is the Latin word for uh, butterfly. And we thought we would try and save the monarch, or at least begin that process. So in the construction of this building, uh, it's a double skin facade. So it's got, a, it's got multiple layers, and it wraps around the building to the top where there's a pollinator garden and an education center, and then continues into the back, and then an atrium through the center. And inside that wall space of the building uh, is uh, everything you would need for habitat for monarch butterflies to thrive. So it's got milkweeds, gracilli, caterpillar stages, adult butterflies, areas for them to lay their eggs. The entire place is a, is a, is a a fantasy realm for butterflies to actually thrive. Uh, and it costs a little bit more, but they don't lose a single bit of square footage in their commercial space. Uh, and that this becomes a sanctuary that communicates to folks that these butterflies are disappearing. We got a grant, so how do you pay for something like this? We got a grant from a, a very unlikely group of uh, actors, uh, the drone group at Intel. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, drones are everywhere now doing fancy things, uh, mostly for our pleasure, some kind of a digital circus. Uh, but we were thinking, can drones be deployed to s help save a creature from extinction? So we created these little artificial micro drones that have a base AI that deals with temperature control, humidity, airflow, noise cancellation, and food, and they're the stewards of this sanctuary. 
So they keep the real butterflies alive, the artificial ones do that. And that's sponsored by Intel, and their marketing team thought that they can't, and I, I don't work for Intel, by the way, full disclosure, I just, they, they did something that we thought was phenomenal uh, to promote uh, somehow their product at some point, uh, because they can't sell it with normal advertising. So this type of money, instead of just going into ads and magazines that we don't pay attention to, went towards some new technology to save these butterflies. And these drones also have little cameras in them, and they record all the drama of the butterflies, how they reproduce and, uh, and well, what caterpillars are eating. And you see that on the exterior of the building. So you see these beautiful monarchs doing their thing. So from far away, if you're not sure what's happening in the building, you'll see these incredible screens playing butterfly images. And when you get close, you'll see the entire building, the, the, the glass works and this diagrid structure is just filled with uh, butterflies um, thriving. And if you have an office space on the inside, you look out your window into this habitat of biodiversity for all of these butterflies. And so, uh, now we're not gonna save all of the monarchs by doing this, but this is a project that made sense to the client who had no interest in it before, made sense to a major global corporation uh, who also had no interest in it before, and will probably make sense to the people of New York as they become aware that a species native to our city is disappearing and that's probably not acceptable and that there's some things you can do about it. So this was one of our first projects that rethought um, how we could save monarchs. Yeah, okay, he, he wants to talk, but so I'll, I'll just pause there uh, because we, he, I know he has a lot of questions and we had a great session this afternoon uh, about just this. So yeah, I you, we, you're burning. We, we, might, have, we might have run out of material to talk about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it's really interesting what uh, Mitch is sort of introducing is that we're in the midst of a crisis. I think that's undeniable. I think most people in this room would, have, would accept that climate change is happening and that something must be done about it. But I think what uh, Mitch has described with this beautiful project with the, the Monarch Butterfly Building, is that what we, mm -hmm. what we call yeah. it? Monarch Sanctuary. Monarch Sanctuary uh, in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we all want to go and see that when, when, it's, when it's done. Yeah. Um, that there's an imperative upon architects and designers to incorporate uh, these kind of features within buildings because we do need to do something. We are in the midst of a crisis. And it's coming to the, f the first thought talks, my first uh, instinct was, um, and we, we, we talked about this, there's a lot of different, there's a wealth of things here, but there's the housing crisis, mm. um, which we're all, it's a big hot topic. We've got a traffic crisis in, in the city here, and I'm sure many other cities around the world. But, so there is this imperative upon artists, designers, planners to do something about this. Um, we need some radical solutions, Mitch. What, what are you proposing? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> so, so, so <laughs> yeah. you know, radical solutions are, are great to, mm. you know, uh, stir the pot. Mm. And they're interesting. And you're, you're always gonna get some curmudgeon to point out, you know, yeah, that's never gonna work. And a lot of our ideas, we, we, we have all kinds of comments, thank you, internet, that tell us just that. But we start with very practical, off-the-shelf solutions to some of these issues like housing and, and uh, traffic, et cetera. Mm. And we, as a think tank, we, we, try, uh, we do our best to solve it in novel ways. In fact, a lot of things that we need to do uh, are not radical whatsoever. We've had the roadmap to livable cities for a very long time. Uh, we just choose not to do this. And we, we, I brought up a conversation uh, that Bill Gates uh, mentioned, which is, you know, uh, you know essentially we, we're, we're, we're stuck with this massive problem in cities, was it traffic or climate change and uh, housing, and, and someone comes along and really tells you what you need to do. It's like going to the doctor. And the doctor tells you, listen, you eat steak and sugar three times a day, it's really bad for your heart, uh, stop exercise and eat right. It's the same thing we'll say in planning. Uh, make cities walkable. Uh, don't count on highways everywhere. Stop using diesel fuel. Move off of fossil fuels. Think of new energy systems, uh, bio, uh, uh, geothermal, solar, wind. I mean, there are obvious answers to some of this. Uh, and there are ways of deploying them, et cetera. But we, ha we don't need a, a library of radical inventions. There's some very practical things. And there's many guidebooks, Christopher Alexander's Pattern Language that talks about how we could live 
uh, with the Earth's metabolism, with a logic that doesn't wipe things out. Um, and that's good. So we'll take that prescription from the doctor. We'll say, okay, I'm not gonna eat steak and sugary stuff all the time. But then we have the other question, which is, it's really hard for me to you know, stop doing that. I like it. I, I actually like steak. Uh, and and um, so if I continue to do that and my heart starts to fail, uh, is there something else you could do, doctor? And he, he goes, yes, absolutely. We're really good at cardiovascular surgery. We, we'll, we'll buy you 15, 20 more years of life. So if you fail to do what we tell you to do up front, which is pretty easy and logical exercise, eat right, we've always got this system in place that'll, that'll solve it. So what, it, what is the cardiovascular surgery for something like cities or our planet? Well, it, it, it does exist. Um, and I think it's, it's difficult to talk about it because if we rely upon it, we'll just continue doing the things that we're doing and just expect some smart people elsewhere to engineer us out of the problem. But geoengineering as a field is built to do just that. It has all kinds of ideas of removing uh, the acidity levels in the ocean or seeding the clouds with sulfites uh, to reflect uh, solar income back and cool the planet. Uh, and we do need to test these ideas. We do need to work on big radical ideas in geoengineering. Absolutely, because if something does fail and we, we're not ready for it, uh, we, you know, we are doomed. The thing is, is that we, don't, we can only really test it once or twice. And if it doesn't work, everything else is kind of screwed up. Because this, this would be the first surgery at that level. So I think probably the solution is not so much the big radical ideas. They're out there to, to kind of get the, the discussion going. But it's, it's just listening but to people still want to still going to eat steak, aren't they? You're still going to eat steak? Yeah, we're yeah. still going to. Well, it's like we have, you know, yeah. Uh, local planning frameworks, and we have Vision 2040 here in this country to try and, yeah. you know, the policymakers will say that they are delivering on these objectives, and, and locally they'll say that they will uh, address uh, issues of a livable, walkable city once the bypass is built. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and that, that's our quick fix, that's our cardiac surgery. But in the meantime, we all continue on and we're locked into these kind of patterns of behavior. And I'm kind of wondering, and it's something we talked about earlier, yeah. uh, can we not just, you know, I, I'm going to do a blatant piece of self-promotion here. Yeah. <laughs> I mentioned the ghost chapel that's down in the Cloud of Key yeah. and how it uh, references the Isa Shrine in Japan, yeah. uh, which is a construction uh, that every 20, it's been in existence for 1,500 years, but every 20 years it's uh, taken down and beside it they build a new temple. Can we not replace our cities and build new cities? And there's no downturn in the construction. We just keep building new cities and, and dismantle old ones, and we just can. Yeah. And that's that, where we find a kind of harmony, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a radical idea to constantly destroy our cities and rebuild yeah. them at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, uh, Rem Kulas had proposed that and, and others. The, Ish, the Ishi Shrine, what's so beautiful mm -hmm. about that, which is a, a Japanese uh, mm -hmm. ecclesiastical structure, is that for thousands of years, um, the, their, their method of carpentry, their entire uh, uh, thought process has been preserved. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, that is part of the temple's being, is mm -hmm. to reconstruct it. So while they have the existing one, all of that memory is captured mm -hmm. and replicated again and passed mm -hmm. over generations in this bespoke custom craft work mm -hmm. that has a relationship to the person making it and the object being made. Mm -hmm and passed on to the next generation of mm -hmm. carpenters. And then after 20 years, they finished building it, mm -hmm. and they'll wreck the old one and start anew. Uh, the, from a finance model, um, you could think of cities in that form, where a building is done with its return on uh, equity after 20 years, 15 or 20 years, mm -hmm. and then because it's not profitable anymore, uh, wreck it and start another one, or start another one at the same time as you're wrecking others. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll wreak havoc on the environment, but it'll keep people very busy and constantly working. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what we're going to do about heritage in that case if we're deciding well, the, the forms of meaning this. endure as you reproduce and you, you retain your, your heritage at the same time. Yeah, except for the things that we can't rebuild anymore. I'm kind of just thinking upon that because uh, I attended the Michael D. Higgins, who's, who's the president of Ireland. Uh, yeah. He opened the the, uh, the series of first thought talks on home, 
and um, he spoke about the kind of the what we call the Aboriginal people of Australia and, and America, and how they they were in contact with nature and had this sort of rhythm where they, they were in this sort of cyclical relationship. Yeah. And is there something in sort of taking down and tearing down cities that's sort of nomadic, that sort of is similar in a way? I don't know, it's not something we mentioned earlier, but. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we have such a, mm -hmm. a, a terrible relationship mm -hmm. with nature mm -hmm. in general. There's such a disaffection between what we do and what happens in nature. Mm -hmm. Even the definition of nature is, is super confusing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I was to ask everyone in this room what it meant or to write it down on a piece of paper, you're gonna have pretty different answers. Um, I mean, there's one, one version of nature that we often talk about is the Edenic, or the, uh, the, the idea of a, uh, a biblical level of nature, where there's some sense that we're in absolute harmony with the animals and the plants and this planet. And I, and I don't think that's actually ever existed. I mean, I would have loved to have been there in the Garden of Eden where there was that perfect moment, but I, we've never achieved that. And we can think about it on the level of phenomenology that it is possible in our brains to conceive it, but I don't think it's ever happened. And other parts of nature, the, the idea of the primordial, which is before humans ever came around. Well, as soon as we dropped on this earth, we were burning forests to hunt, we were changing rivers, we were definitely changing nature. So we, we actually can't really get back to the primordial state either. Uh, and then there, there are other variants of nature, but mm. for a very long time, humanity has been hell-bent on sort of controlling it. Mm. And more recently, uh, something known as synthetic biology uh, and bioengineering is a very new form of that. And it, it's much different than agrarian nature where we're growing food to keep you know, populations happy. Here we're designing at, at the scale of, I, I, I could say God, but I, but I don't mean it in a religious sense really, but we're tweaking the stuff of life at the smallest possible level. And we're imagining new forms of nature. And we're designing things not made of glass and steel and concrete, but we're tweaking already existing things for human programmatic use. Uh, it's, it's a cellular level. Of, yeah, it's of, at the cell, cellular the level and, and yeah. uh, things like CRISPR, who mm -hmm. don't, if none of you know about that, is a more or less a desktop technique to splice genes together and, and, and make different items, uh, uh, different forms of, of, of morphology. We, we started, when we first started Terraform, we created the first biohacking space, I guess, on the planet. It was called GenSpace. And instead of buying a fancy 3D printer like a lot of architects do, uh, my roommate at Harvard, uh, Dr. Oliver Medvedic, he was uh, in the medical school while there was an architecture school, and we had this dream of well, we often would drink and talk about ideas of what, where biology and architecture can merge. And a lot of those ideas were just terrible. Something about spiders building houses uh, that never went anywhere. But, but when we graduated, we thought to really do this work, uh, we have to build our own laboratory. And we did. We built a fully functional wet cell lab from scratch. And it didn't cost millions of dollars and have an institute to back it. We did it off of eBay and Craigslist and some old school tech, and we built some of the equipment ourselves. So for $30,000, we had a laboratory. And then we started experimenting side by side. What can biology and design do together? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the projects we worked on was something called the in vitro meat habitat. Uh, I can accelerate yeah. to, it's a, it's a meat house project, and if, if you've seen one of my uh, TED Talks, then you mm -hmm. can have comments about it. But the, the back story to that is that we were able to take cells uh, in vitro uh, cell, immortal cell lines from pigs and grow leather into a specified geometry. Not kill an animal and make leather out of it, not use petrochemical pro products and make fake leather, mm. but using the cells of a creature that are mortally replicated, printed on a modified inkjet printer, and make shoes, belts, handbags, uh, clothing, where no sentient creature is harmed. It's victimless leather. And that was a combination of a number of things in regenerative medicine mm -hmm. and what we were doing in our biohacking space. Mm -hmm. And when we first did it, people just laughed, why would you do that? When we were at Harvard asking some folks in regenerative medicine to, to, to work on the project, uh, George Church, who's mm -hmm. the head of uh, Harvard's bio lab there, laughed at us and said, who would wanna make a handbag out of printed leather? Mm -hmm. you know, what's the point of this? What, why would you wanna print meat anyway? 
He was very angry. Just, he's always angry, but he was especially angry. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and then today, <laughs> it's a whole new field. Uh, uh, one company called Modern Meadows was just in the MoMA last year. They're printing uh, uh, leather and making it into shirts and clothing, and, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, another company was making a $300,000 hamburger, but it's meat that's printed in a lab. It's cultured meat. PETA had a prize. They were giving a million dollars for anyone who can figure out uh, uh, ways of eating lab-grown food that people would like. Uh, part of the trick was embedding hemoglobin in it because we like the taste of blood and other things. It didn't quite taste right, but now the Impossible Burger and other variants, there's all these great alternate forms of eating protein. So these, these kind of technologies you use as building blocks, if you're going to use the sort of architecture like yeah. how, how does this transfer itself into our lives? How's, how's this going to impact upon, upon the... Uh, all right, so the, the chairs that you're sitting on, every yeah. chair in this room, I think mm -hmm. ours are fairly nice, yep. is going to end up in a landfill. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's its fate. Mm -hmm. It was designed to be tossed out. It was designed for obsolescence, so we can buy more chairs to keep this Keynesian economy going. That's, that's what's happening. So uh, what we can do with something with biosynthetics is instead of making things that are you know, made of bent steel and, and designed for unitized volumes and mass production, we can grow chairs in a lab. Mm -hmm. Another material we we're working with is called mycelium. It's a root base of uh, any mushroom. Uh, the parochial term would be mushroom. And we were growing chairs in a laboratory. I first did that for my older daughter for her kindergarten class. We grew these chairs out of perfectly shaped mycelium blocks. And it actually is it's an interesting process. You feed a mold uh, agricultural waste, then you acculturate it with uh, the mycelium, and it takes a reishi was the substance we were using. It takes about seven days of growth. It eats the agricultural waste, and it fills out the shape of the mold, and you pop it out, and you've got a chair. Mm -hmm. And it's a chair that you can sit on and use for years. It's absolutely fine. You can eat it. Technically, it doesn't <laughs> taste good. But, uh, we eat crayons in kindergarten. There's a learning curve to everything in life. Uh, but this chair that you eat is okay. And you yeah. can tell mom and dad we, we're eating a chair, well, we're sitting on chairs that were grown in a lab made of mushrooms. And they'll look at these square-shaped, odd, funky chairs. We actually put the funk in functionalism. That's another story altogether. But, uh, and when these chairs are done, when you're finished with them, you throw them into a garden and they feed thousands of other forms of life. They don't end up in a landfill. So it's a circular economy. Fully circular. Of it's materials. Just, and it's a, it's a positive mm. uh, uh, model. And we can, we can use this in every kind of building material, potentially. I mean, our, you know, we all recycle. We all put our, our water bottles in yeah, yeah. the right bin and, and everything yeah, else. Yeah, I can talk about the design of water bottles. But you know, this, this material is being used by <coughs> this company, Ecovative. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can look it up, Ecovative, Eben mm -hmm. Bear. It's one of the guys, and they're using it for packaging material. Mm -hmm. It's ideal for replacing all of styrofoam. Mm -hmm. Do you know how hard it is to throw out some styrofoam and to recycle it? It's these mm -hmm. big, bulky objects that weigh nothing, so it's, you have to crush them, and even crushing them, well, it's fun. It's mm -hmm. fun to crush them, unless that's your job all day long. Uh, but mm -hmm. you, and then trying to you stick them in a truck that uses a lot of fuel to bring it to some recycling facility, which when you're done recycling it, you just get a, a pea-sized bit of material. And styrofoam is just awful. It's awful stuff. Mm -hmm. But mycelium can be used to replace all of your packaging for your refrigerators or new speakers or, or new computers, whatever you're buying. It's a pretty, pretty fantastic material. Do you think, is there a question of aesthetics? I mean, do we want to live in a, a mushroom house? Mm. No, we don't. <laughs> uh, aesthetics are a problem. Yeah. So it's like. A long time, well, when um, Le Corbusier uh, yeah. first produced these chairs, the ch Chazelon, uh, they, they had cow skins on mm -hmm. them. And people would go into the store, and they would fall in love with that chair and say, I want that one. And then they would have one sent to their house. You know, they would order one. And it would arrive, and it would be a slightly different cow skin yeah. pattern. Yeah. They were like, that's not what I saw in the store. But it's just, well, you know, cows aren't identical. So you're always going to get a different pattern. So it took some time for people to realize it's, mm -hmm. that you're going to have variation. With something like the mycelium work, you're going to have variation in it because it's all natural. And we just have to so be accustomed to that aesthetic. Individually but, designed, personalized furniture. 
Yeah, you can you can yeah. grow it into shapes and write your name in mushroom. Um, I guess. I kind, of, I kind of thought that uh, some of this made me think about there's there's a lot of uh, med tech in Galway. I don't know if you know this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Med you know, one of the biggest yeah. employers, uh, and we're one of the about ten global hubs for med tech. And talking to, to you earlier about how we can integrate. Um, biosynthetic materials into our built environment. It kind of made me think about um, how people like Cura Medical Devices here on the campus, um, kind of, they, they kind of uh, implant designs that are more in tune with the human body. Yeah. And I think this is what we're kind of, you're proposing in a way, but you're doing the same thing for the built environment. So we're actually set up for this already. <laughs> we're, we're ready to go here. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> what's supposed to stop Galway or Ireland becoming the global hub for this kind of technology? Uh, I, I just think what, what's amazing about medicine mm -hmm. uh, is you, you become very focused in mm -hmm. a specific area and you do that really well. Mm -hmm. And you do that for years, if not decades. Mm -hmm. I think design, and that's the, you know, as in an arts festival, yeah. you, you get folks that have really good imaginations. And imagination is pro your imagination is the most powerful tool you can have. Uh, this is where you have the seed of invention. This is where ideas come from, a lot of bad ideas, a lot of bad invention, but eventually you hit it. If you can incorporate or work with folks that have these incredible skills in, in medical science and med tech, be surprised at what you can create. Uh, and I, I think more of that synergy needs to happen, more of that discussion. Collaborative kind of approach. Absolutely, there's just so much yeah. you can do. We, we have a, a facility in the Brooklyn Navy Yard that is built to do just that. We got a $46 million grant from the governor, and we took what was originally just a small maker space. Uh, we, we had one of the first maker spaces you would find in New York, uh, and we created a maker village. So we have uh, not just one little garage with a bunch of fun people in there doing stuff, mm -hmm. but we have 80-something companies that are working around the clock that are on top of one another. And you get to see what's happening. So the folks that are doing med tech are bumping into the folks that are doing lighting design, are bumping into the folks that are doing robotics, and are bumping into the folks that are doing uh, civics and law. And you have all of these cool overlaps, mm. and the idea is to eventually find new territories, new discoveries, and that's mm. where innovation happens. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've had a number of uh, great projects come out of there, well, it's more, more so on the side the, of... The best kind of conversations happen on the staircase. They do, they do. If you've got an innovative district with this got technology, Yeah. Artists, uh, scientists, architects, planners. Yeah, yeah, breaking yeah. down those yeah. disciplines, which is yeah. a platitude at this point, but it doesn't mm. happen mm. enough. At NYU, it takes me you know, two years to just team up with the guy who has an office across from me. Mm. In a space like this, you just do it for shits and giggles and see where it goes. One of, one of the earlier projects that formed a big company mm. was based on a, a, a medical group and a design productizing group. Uh, we're obsessed with uh, nipples. Out of all, well, I guess we're all obsessed with nipples <laughs> at some point. Uh, but they were obsessed specifically because they both had kids, uh, their teams, they had some new children. And when mommy uh, you know, has the baby latch onto the nipple and then there's that process, but then when you go to solid feeding, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a problem. I don't know anyone who's able to feed a young kid mm -hmm. uh, with a spoon where it doesn't go all over their face because they, they're moving off this soft, pliable, organic thing into you know, the world of metal or plastic airplanes or whatever kind of trick we're using to feed children. Mm -hmm. and, and they decide to, to build spoons based off of the geometry, shape, and, and base morphology of the human nipple. Mm -hmm. So they had the, there's really cool uh, spoons called Spoony that were perfect for young kids that are learning how to eat mm -hmm. uh, to immediately use their latching mechanism and start scooping up food and it doesn't end up all over their face. And that led to other things. After that company started, they started working in diabetes, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it's, so, but you wouldn't have that kind of clashing if you don't put people together. Uh, yeah. uh, and, 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 you know, and there are a lot of people that, that are not comfortable doing that. Because we're, we're, we're stuck in a narrative, so we need to change this yeah. fictional narrative. Yeah, the fictional that, narrative. That we're, that we're doing, I mean. Yeah, no, yeah. There, so we, we were, so another thing about design is that mm. design is amazing at getting the general physics of almost any idea. Mm. And that we use uh, narratives, descriptions, stories mm. to kind of bring us to a new place. Mm. And, and without that, they're not gonna work. Just period. I'll give you a really good example of a kind of a design narrative. Uh, Jules Verne in Paris. Mm. 
imagined, what was it, almost two centuries ago, going to the moon. Now, it's, it was impossible back then, but he didn't care. He also didn't promise that he was gonna get people to the moon. He just wrote a fictive narrative where he imagined in great detail an exciting story that involved booster rockets that would decouple from a central mass, penetrate the atmosphere, a landing module, lunar landing module that would land on the moon itself, and then return in a capsule with a space shield, deploy parachutes, land in the ocean, be picked up by the Navy. Mm -hmm. One of the most popular books you could ever read. It captured our imagination. Mm -hmm. So what happened when John F. Kennedy was confronting Sputnik, mm -hmm. uh, he said, we're gonna go to the moon, get there. All of the aerospace engineers just thought, well, we have no clue, our roadmap is Jules Verne, let's start thinking about that process. And it was a really good point of departure. We do this all the time. If you've ever seen an episode of Star Trek, I mean, those, those handheld recorders that Mr. Spock is using is, is my iPhone. We were able to explain to people that a smartphone is similar to those things you'd see on Star Trek that talks to some satellite or spaceship up there that has all kinds of information in it. We need those narratives to get us to different places. We have a lot of bad ones, uh, but we, you know, or things that haven't reached fruition. I mean, like, where's my jetpack? I often hear about that all the time. We we'll get jetpacks are here. They've been here since the 80s. Uh, if you remember the Olympics in Barcelona, we flew a jetpack in. It lit the torch. You can buy a Martin jetpack for $100,000. We just there are other issues with what happens when you have a jetpack. There's also a jet man, and so there's a whole there's lots of fun stuff with with that. So the narrative is still there. We still are approaching it, uh, but that's how we work together as a kind of a, 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 a singular mind or a collective. A society needs those narratives so that the logic in place can be teased out as we slowly build up to one of them. And that's all design. So it's an opportunity to use imaginative solutions to address these fundamental problems, which I think has been a theme throughout a lot of the the theatre productions within Galway Arts Festival too about migration issues and we've got Trump, we've got Brexit, and all the all the big issues that we all seem a bit powerless and overwhelmed to deal with. But I think yeah. what's coming through from me is that there's some sort of opportunity to uh, to change that narrative if we just can be harness that imagination which is all within us, and and it's not impossible yeah. to. Uh, <laughs> to overcome that, is it? Yeah, no, we need a lot more imagination on that front. Yeah. Um, I mean, in that case, it's probably a little bit easier. We've, we've had examples before that seem mm. to work better. Mm. So imagining the past reoccurring is mm. a little bit easier, but, mm. but, but writing about it uh, to solve problems in traffic, mm. for instance, yep. absolutely possible. At MIT, one of the things that I did there was imagine cars that were soft, mm. which, I don't know, again, so where you start, you start with a lot of bad things and you have a lot of bad ideas, but eventually you hit something that mm. treads water. Uh, and so what is a soft car? Why have a soft car? The only reason uh, we were thinking about it is because ever since the dawn of history and Henry Ford, we've had shiny precious metal boxes that say, don't touch me, don't rub up against me, don't look at me when I'm driving, Urgh. especially in LA, uh, it's, a, it's just a nasty way to move. Uh, so what if they were soft? And it was a kind of a representation mm -hmm. of another body, another vessel, or an extension of your own organism. Mm -hmm. So the soft car, uh, I did a number of these iterations, was super lightweight, uh, made out of ETFE foils and air bladders, just lightweight materials. The entire vehicle was really, uh, om had almost no moving parts, like all electric engines. Mm -hmm. So the drivetrain suspension motoring was inside these soft wheels. And I made these um, beautiful, crazy sheep cars that would move in flocks and herds in a kind of a gentle congestion where you would rub up against your neighbor and look out and say chow and go back to reading your book as you're on your commute. And, and they would be shared so you can hop on and hop off these vehicles. And they don't need to move faster than something like 30 miles an hour because that's the speed limit in Paris, Shanghai, New York, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can possibly move that fast or much faster here in mm -hmm. Galway. I, don't, I, I saw traffic today, it wasn't yep. moving at all. So if they were in sheep cars, at least you can honk, you know, bah, and you just kind of <laughs> rub up against other people, see your neighbor, and sort of squeeze down the street and share those streets with pedestrians. Mm -hmm. Because these cars are super lightweight, they're just basically big beach balls on, on wheels. Mm -hmm. So if you hit, somebody, you're more like you're rubbing up against them, they might laugh because they're tickled, but they're not, they're not in a hospital. 
Uh, you mentioned the sharing. You probably, yeah. When we walked up here, but, you know, we saw the, the, the colony of swans in the river and the, yeah. the other birds and other wildlife. I think uh, you talked about rewilding the city in New York. I mean, it, yeah. it's, a, it's obviously a very different environment compared to New York and Galway. And, yeah. But it's similar. It's a similar kind of uh, relationship, I suppose. You're talking about symbiotic kind of relationship between not just materials and on a cellular level, but also just that we actually. Um, you mentioned just walking up about um, the only law yeah. that was ever written uh, outside of every every law is for human sort of advancement, or whatever. What was this? Yeah. No. Um, yeah. The entire history of the world. Yeah. There's never been a law written for anybody else except for humans. Mm -hmm. That's every culture mm -hmm. all over the planet mm -hmm. since the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. So it was until 1973 that we created the Endangered Species Act. Mm -hmm. That was the first law in the books that protected something else other than humans. Mm -hmm. And it really didn't do much. The only thing it did is give you the right to survive. That's the, that's the bare minimum we can do for other species. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're gonna try and stop killing you move you off the endangered list mm. to a threatened list. Mm. And then when you're off the threatened list, we leave you alone. Mm. Uh, we, we've had two successful, only two successful species were actually removed mm. off the endangered species list mm. and the threatened list. And that was the bald eagle, uh, because in the United States, if we killed our bird. Mm. Um, You'd be in trouble. <laughs> well, just a, no you, you, one was happy you, with you, that you, idea. You it was really logo. bad politically to kill yeah. off our bird. Um, but then, honestly, we would just pick another one, knowing the U.S. But it's all, it's all about our common home. So we've got one planet. Yeah. We've got limited amounts of uh, resources. Uh, the embodied energy in construction is one of the biggest uh, consumers, I suppose, yeah. of, of these limited resources. Um, so perhaps we need to rewrite uh, some legislation that... that brings these things in, but it is all about migration, about yeah. all these people, that, um, as well as nature, that, that this is all part of what you're talking about, I, I feel. Yeah. No, we, 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 yeah. should, we should get, I think it should, mm -hmm. it should be easy to give rights to other mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. besides just each other, and we're, we're, but we're having difficult so the right difficulties to with, the, with ourselves. A home, the right to, uh, yeah. well, to live. A, a good example is the yeah. American Institute of Architects mm -hmm. refuses to design death chambers. Mm -hmm. So that's like our low bar, mm -hmm. that we won't design death chambers. Uh, and that was only recently passed. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't think I, I could live with myself as an architect if I was responsible for mm -hmm. something like that. Even if you agree with the death penalty, mm -hmm. just the idea that you're doing that is, is a despicable act on mm -hmm. some level. Well, mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that. The intention isn't despicable. But mm -hmm. I, I think a few hundred years from now, as we're being judged, Mm. Uh, a lot of folks will have a, a big problem with that. So would you and say that architects and designers have a duty of care within their professional practice to address these big issues like extinction? Yeah, I, I don't think I mean, that we should be complicit in wiping out other species. Yeah. I think we could say that's a, a, an ethical position to have mm. uh, being responsible for the built environment. Mm. I mean, we don't need another Walmart if it means mm. wiping out a whole species of salamander. Mm which has happened before. Mm. Uh, and uh, because there's money involved and people take on these jobs and there's money in politics, mm. as we're well aware of, uh, you know, it makes it hard to refuse it. But if we, mm. we build in a system where we have rights for uh, such creatures and it's, you're ethically obligated to follow them, I think that's, mm. a, that's also a, a, a way to start mm. doing it. And, and how are we gonna bring in everybody from a grassroots level, like the, the mediators, I mean, the guys that don't turn off the lights and yeah. Uh, all, that, all that thing, is that, is that the challenge? Yeah, the, uh, there, there's a lot of challenges and I don't think there's yeah. any, any silver bullet. I mean, yeah. it, there's a, you know, another side to it is, a, a, so there's 50% of the people that don't even think climate change is real or it's a hoax created by the Chinese, et cetera. And we've had scientists march in Washington, D.C. Uh, because they just want to tell you this is a bunch of facts and that's that. I don't know if you guys know this, uh, this comedian, Ricky Gervais, you must know him, oh, yeah. right? He's, Here's a great little talk about um, what he was saying, um, the difference between mm -hmm. uh, fiction, books of fiction, mm -hmm. and s stories like Shakespeare, mm -hmm. and books of religious books. Uh, if they all disappeared one day, uh, they're never coming back. Mm -hmm. They just, if, 
society was to live on, or we, you know, some great cataclysm happened, they wouldn't come back. There'd be variants of them, but they wouldn't come back exactly like they are. But science would. After a thousand years, if we destroyed all the books today, a thousand years from now, through observation and through learning, we would come to the same conclusion. The idea that, 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 that uh, it's not true or we have to decolonize these things or that we would question them, I mean, we should question them as canon and, and stand on the shoulders of giants and build further, but, but uh, th these are just facts. Things are getting very hyperbolic now and muddied, and, and that's, that's pretty scary. Yeah. You know, you know, actually, I wanted to, I brought up a water bottle, which I shouldn't have done, but this is, this is a type of behavior that you know, I embrace, but I shouldn't, but I enjoy the convenience. Mm -hmm. And I think many people enjoy this convenience. Mm -hmm. So to undo something like this is not mm -hmm. an easy thing to do mm -hmm. uh, because it's here and we accept it. Uh, and so part of that problem is how do we design a system for this that um, makes sure that it, it doesn't harm the environment? Uh, so, you know, one, one method might be to fall in love with plastic, mm -hmm. which I, I know it sounds a little silly, but I, I'm serious. We, we treat plastic as if it has barely any purpose. It's one of the most amazing materials in the modern age. Everything in your life involves plastic. If you were told tomorrow that plastic causes cancer, you wouldn't be able to, you'd be frozen. You wouldn't be able to touch your alarm clock when you wake up go open up your shower curtain, you wouldn't be able to get behind your car, we'd be done. It's just we don't love plastic. We, it's like, uh, mm -hmm. I don't wanna make any metaphors, but we're constantly tossing it away as if it had no value. Think of something like a diamond ring. A diamond, which has nowhere near the same value as plastic. If a diamond ring uh, falls down a sink while you're washing your hands, what do you do? You go crazy, you call a plumber, you call your husband, or whoever, you do everything you can to retrieve that diamond because of some prescribed value, but it doesn't have the same value on society. If we could fall in love with plastic like we fall in love with diamonds, then it's fine. Then, then having this water bottle is perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. right, building a system that does that is, is, the, is, the, is the problem, and there's ways mm -hmm. to create incentives to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's coming back to those fictional narratives. I mean, if the narrative about a plastic water bottle, if it's acceptable, if you try to apply the same, if you use that as a metaphor for the, the city, um, we're just locked into these, these ways of doing things. We hop in our car, we drive to the out of town shopping center. Yeah. We, you know, we cross the river to go to work. Um, and that's all acceptable. We seem, we seem to accept that um, passively. Yeah, well, do we, do you know it's, so, so, I mean, you, you're not, no one's gonna change a city overnight. Yeah. So cities, uh, I mean, you have to think of things in scales of economy, <clears throat> is a really good question. <clears throat> so, so things happen based on the kind of the sector of interface <clears throat> they operate in, <clears throat> uh, the kind of the level of design and the people designing it, and then the time it takes for those things to come to fruition. So a good example would be um, cell phone technology. Within five to seven years, you can go from a napkin sketch to a brand new type of cell phone technology that's available everywhere, Europe and the United States, and you can buy it. It's that quick, and it's something that works in this kind of associative system. But if you want to change something like a car, uh, you know, an all electric vehicle, you can have prototypes, you can have those things existing, but to get everyone involved in driving around in electric cars, that's a 20 year endeavor, at least. Uh, it just takes that long before something is uh, uh, available everywhere that you can purchase, like mm -hmm. a Prius, which is a hybrid, or a Tesla. Mm -hmm. uh, for architecture, mm -hmm. we're gonna scale up even further, mm -hmm. it takes about 40 years to change architecture, mm -hmm. minimum. Why is that? Because we build buildings mm -hmm. and we don't expect the roof to fail or the windows or the boiler heater, mm -hmm. and we don't change anything until it does fail. Mm -hmm. and then we put in those new models. Mm -hmm. So the city, if it's a, a scale even bigger than architecture, that's a hundred year shift, if not more, before you finally see the base operation of cities changing. The, tech, the hints are certainly there. Mm -hmm. uh, things like, uh, you know, how we uh, go to work every day is, mm -hmm. is shifting. But it, it, it takes some time before we're gonna find it uh, a ubiquitous condition. Mm -hmm everywhere. I mean, it's, it's we have bit, experimental yeah. cities like Mazdar in Abu Dhabi, which is a super futuristic city by Foster. 
But it, it, I don't expect everyone to be living in a Mazdar environment anytime soon. It's just there's a, a lot of other s small subroutines and changes that need to happen before but we it, get it. It comes back to what you said about your, your mushroom shades long. I mean, nothing should be disposable. And uh, the Arts Festival is very cleverly appropriated spaces uh, around Galway City, the, the uh, Festival Gallery for one, yeah. um, which was a former uh, newspaper print factory and now it's got a new life as, a, as an art gallery. And we do have to appropriate these things. Necessity is the mother of invention. Um, and you're sort of applying this to building materials and every sort of process and every, yeah. so that everything has its circular cycle, but we just can't continue to do that either, can we? We need to. Well, we can do adaptive reuse, if that's yeah. what you're talking about. Adaptive yeah. reuse, take an old uh, factory of some sort mm. and, and convert that into a museum or mm. some housing project. That, that's mm. a really good idea. That, mm. That's fine. That's better than mm. building something from scratch. Mm. Uh, and, and we should have those low-hanging fruit ideas mm. up front whenever we approach anything. Mm. I mean, that's just the way to do it. Uh, and then as you, you become uh, more conversant in something like biomaterials and they become more viable, then you introduce that mm. into the system. Uh, but without these imaginary narratives, this discussion of what your neighborhood might be like in the future, uh, it'll be very difficult for us to get there. So that's the fundamental question is, what kind of city do we, do we want to live in? Yeah. And it's not up to planners or policymakers or architectural designers to decide upon that. It's actually... Well, I'm not going to use the word consumer. Uh, right. Am I? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Calling people it, it is, it is, it is, Calling people consumers. You know, community, the public uh, must participate in these. Uh, these yeah. it's, not, it's not something that's left to somebody else. And, and uh, ultimately, we're all empowered to make those decisions, I, I guess. Yeah, I don't, I don't, how many here have mm. spent time rethinking mm. their neighborhood? Anyone raise their hand? Has you mm. ever spent any time doing that? Okay, that's great. And have you had the opportunity to talk to some folks in planning or in government or in the political class or mm -hmm. someone that had the power to create that change? Is there anyone here that's done that? Somebody like to a few. offer up their view? Well, there's be around traveler accommodation, so it'll be quite Go ahead. Yeah, no, we'd love to take some yeah. questions. Yeah, it's a good time for questions, I think. Oh, no. There's a question over here, I think. Yeah. Uh, you've just said there that we, we've, um, you know, we need to participate more mm. in building and redesigning our city. Yeah. In many ways, people have. You know, people have participated. There was a, a Galway traffic forum set up a few years ago by um, mm. the then mayor, Hildegard Nocton, asking people, uh, what would they like to do about traffic and, uh, mm. and such questions? And most people got back to that and mm. said, we want more public transport, essentially. The majority of people said, we want more public transport. Mm. So why didn't they go off and implement that, the powers that be? And mm. I think, I mean, it was raised, the power. And I think the problem is there are vested interests at play. Yeah. Economic and political vested interests that mm. are you know, they're selling car insurance, mm. they're selling cars, uh, mm. fuel. Mm. There's a lot of businesses involved in that that are putting pressure on the powers that be uh, to stop any development yeah. in sustainability. I think you talked about that, the predatory yeah. kind of economy. So, I'll leave it. Yeah, yeah, so, thank you very much. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. So yeah. what often happens is something that we call predatory delay. Mm. And those are the powers, uh, big companies in oil, et cetera, that have a lot of vested interest in keeping things the way they are. But they're not gonna say that up front. You're gonna have a participatory mm -hmm. process where the public comes and makes comments and wants change and talks about putting in solar panels or th rethinking traffic or putting in shared vehicles or electric systems, what have you. And they'll agree. They'll say, that's a great idea, I love your idea, that's wonderful, here's a little bit of money, not enough, but here's some money, we support it openly but every single day they're in business, it's just more profit for them. So the idea is to kind of push those narratives, ideas about uh, you know, change. If it's not beneficial to them, they'll sort of tease it forward a little bit, mm -hmm. but never really quite implement it. As long as you could put money into politicians or 
have lobbies that create change and there's no way to mm. have a, a, a transparency up front, the predatory delay model is the most insidious thing that we're seeing. And it took a long time mm. to realize that that's actually happening at a, at a very large scale. And it's a very useful tool for the people that are in power to constantly deploy this kind of predatory delay thing. Because you, you can never point the finger at them quite right and say you're the one stopping it because they'll say mostly we're for it, just not today. Let's do it five years from now when the government changes and new people are in office and people don't show up again to that meeting. And then they have a new meeting with different people that have another idea. So that's, uh, that's a bit frustrating. But there, there's tools that we're all fami familiar with that could probably stop that. I, I'm not promising that we're gonna get there. I would like to uh, create more narratives around it, but we don't have those narratives. But uh, e-government and other things like uh, crypto ledgers and blockchain, these are great ways to absolutely say these facts happened at this time, kept by a neutral party that no one can alter whatsoever, and that these smart contracts get deployed at specific times where you can't change them because they're, they're locked into a crypto logic. Uh, and that's a, that's a way to, to trade tokens or ideas or uh, change traffic by locking these systems into an e-government form. But people aren't all comfortable or yet comfortable, I think millennials are, with using the internet and government together and a lot of the different uh, uh, computational systems that can support it. Democracy is an amazing thing, but it works when we're in an agora, like it was in ancient Greece, where it was just 100 people in a room. And actually, to be specific, it was 100 men and they were landowners, uh, so there, was, there were no poor folks or slaves, and there were no women, and 100 men, more or less, could agree on big principles and get stuff done. But when we have the government set up that we have now with the populations and the density that's associated with it, it becomes really intractable. So the idea that we don't use uh, some level of moderation in the form of, 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 of internet-based tools or e-governance-based tools uh, is crazy. I think we're going to see more of that, and maybe that will be the good side of Facebook. I think there, there, there's, there's a lot of problems with that, those identities that are out there now, but they're, I think that's one of the places we can find real change and stop predatory delay. And these are systems to be designed, and, to, and I've read some of these stories, uh, these fictive narratives, but they're not quite popular yet, and there isn't one version of it that we're all agreeing upon but more work can be applied to that area. Yeah. Good question. Thank you guys so much. I'm really enjoying this. I'm visiting from Los Angeles, California. It's my first time in Ireland. Yeah. Sorry about America too. <laughs> it's just, there's a lot going on there. We're having, um, I'd like to hear more about housing, um, housing solutions. Um, something that I'm active with back home is the tiny home movement also repurposing RVs, things like that. Um, Eco-dome homes, I have friends building in Mexico. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear more specifically about homes and solutions around the material and how you're creating these homes. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those who don't know anything about the tiny home movement, uh, it's actually fantastic. It's counterintuitive. Mm -hmm to what the typical American's trying to build, which is, we, we call them McMansions. But most of us aspire to have some house in, you know, on three or four acres of land that is mountainous in its proportion and bigger than our neighbor for some reason. Not all of us, just the 50% that voted for Bush, uh, not Bush, well, the vote <laughs> started there, Trump. Uh, and there's, along comes this, uh, uh, you know, this, this alternate form of housing uh, these tiny homes that, are, that you can build yourself in a DIY fashion. Uh, the instructions are available on the web. There's all trading, free open trading of ideas and sourcing of methods. And then you, you have a house that's small and, is, and, and beautiful and yours and, and is mobile and is not, it isn't associated with all the other things that you normally get from mobile homes, which is indigent communities and, and difficult poverty, et cetera. So it is a, it's a great movement. Housing, I mean, it's a gargantuan topic, but what we've been doing in that field is thinking of the, the base materials and how we construct the suburbs. And, and that's been um, a, a difficult thing to change over time, but it's, it's gotta change. Uh, 
Uh, and what we've done is we've looked at ways of, of merging the suburban landscape with the actual landscape, where there's no distinction between ecosystems and the place that you live. So we started um, growing uh, um, homes made from uh, woody plants. And we took a technology that's 2,500 years old, it's called pleaching, where it's grafting plants into shapes. And we blew it up to the scale of roughly uh, a nine foot uh, uh, home, uh, roughly in different shapes. And um, we have a technology which I'm not allowed to show you, but I can okay. tell you it's under patent. We open source the first one, but the technology is, is actually, it's not really a technology. We're, we're in the business of, of tickling and teasing plants. Which sounds weird. Uh, but what we do is we, yeah, we, we, yeah. we have a dark chamber and we, we grow different types of woody plants, uh, ficus, uh, variegated ivy, uh, banyan, all these different types of things. And in this dark chamber, we convince plants that they're not gonna hit soil. And we get them to grow one single taproot looking for soil. So we're constantly teasing it to make one single wet noodle, one single root that will, uh, that's desperately trying to get to soil, but it'll never find it. It's a total, it's a normal function of most woody plant species. When it hits soil, it does what all plants do, which is it spreads out dendritically so it can get the most amount of water. But we never let that happen. So we keep it in this chamber for a year or two, and we get a nine foot uh, root, which is pretty amazing. And we pull it out of that chamber into the light, sunlight, and we tap the root into the soil. Immediately, it sends a hormonal signature throughout the entire plant. It lignifies, it grows bark, starts with leaf propagation, and it's alive, but we have a living two by four stud, a living construction element to rethink housing. We graft them together so they become stronger to absorb impact from lateral forces, et cetera. And we were getting homes made out of essentially what you would find in, in many areas where, where vines are on top of each other. Here we just shape them for human programmatic use. So we're really just nudging or teasing nature to rethink uh, housing. And this has a positive impact mm -hmm. on the environment. It's not a zero impact, which does no harm, but it also does no good. This is actually accountable for you know, a few hundred years of the industrial revolution and it mm -hmm. helps scrub the air. It keeps things alive. It's, it's got a minimal amount. There's almost no fuel used in making it. Mm -hmm. And the scaffolds, if you would like to shape it with scaffolding, you could grow the plants for about five to 10 years on the scaffolding, and once they've grown into your home, you can reuse that scaffolding elsewhere. But you can grow thousands of these homes for thousands of families where there's a, a positive impact on the landscape. But so it's a much different way of thinking of it's a It's a slow, it takes time. Yeah, it takes time. It, so, takes, it takes time, yeah. well, you could genetically modify it. Plants, uh, woody plants can be modified by paper companies, and they are growing poplar like 30 feet within a couple of years, which is, uh, I wouldn't recommend that for housing. Yeah. But, you've, but you've also done some more emergency type of designs too, like the cricket shelter. So it's like, it, there's different models of housing, so one might yeah. take time, like the, the, the pleaching method, but also. Yeah, we, we, just we, on, the, on the housing thing, we were also looking yeah. at combining housing and food. Yeah. So that's another big problem, especially in the developing world. So communities in some kind of a crisis, like an earthquake or, mm some a refugee camp uh, in a, in a, in a war-torn area. Uh, it's very difficult to get access to not only shelter for yourself, housing for yourself, but also food. So we created this thing called the, the Cricket Farm and Shelter, which is essentially a, a substance-based farming system, mm. and, which that's that picture. There you go, that's the one slide I brought today, apparently. Yeah. Uh, that thing over there. Uh, it's combining the growing of crickets along with a place to uh, house your family, either temporary or permanently, depending on what you want to do. But mm -hmm. the entire exterior is a place to grow um, or, or harvest crickets. Why crickets? Because it's an awesome source of protein. Uh, I had some pork burger today at yep. the museum, which was incredible. But we can't live off of pork cows, pigs, chicken, lamb. We eat so much of that stuff. The, uh, the, the livestock that we produce creates enormous problems when it comes to water and greenhouse gas emissions and land use. Mm -hmm. And we just expect to eat all of that. And if I'm, if I'm in a refugee camp, I have no water to spare 
for my animals. I have to keep it for my family. So where are we going to get protein for uh, our family in this case? So this housing structure grows protein from insects, crickets. Every six weeks, the crickets die naturally and they get milled into a powder. Uh, the reason for that is because I don't, I don't want to eat a screaming face with wings and strange. And I'm never, even if you dip it in chocolate, I can't eat that. But if it's in a powder, I can make it into stuff, uh, like uh, you know, uh, different types of noodles or bagels or bonbons. Mm -hmm. And we actually developed this for the first for nations or areas in crisis, but we also have one for the developed world. Mm -hmm. Working with Michelin-rated chefs, in our housing project, mm. who are tuning the flavor of the crickets. Mm. We're feeding them apple cores, lime rinds, orange peels. Their bodies absorb that flavor. They die naturally after six weeks, and then we mill it into a flower. Mm. And you can get the taste of the apple inside there. And it's super sanitary, super hygienic, and it, and it doesn't work unless it tastes absolutely brilliant. Mm. So that, that was, that was a, a unintended goal of creating a system of going mm. from pasture to plate inside your own housing project. I think something you mentioned earlier when we were talking yeah. to you about, about integrating agriculture and food production into the city in a, in a more kind of relating to your question a little bit more perhaps. Um, you talk about dense, densifying yeah. cities rather, rather than the sort of donut effect which we seem to be getting our dispersed settlements. Yeah, but I mean, we, we have here. The, the idea, you should, we, we don't yeah. know where our food comes from. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of you probably have gardens, but mm -hmm. most of us in larger cities mm -hmm. don't have access to the food that we grow, or we don't grow our food at all. So we were looking at ways of providing small scale gardens, micro gardens. Uh, we have actually these things called farm pods and other projects mm -hmm. that where you grow your food in an urban area. And there's even larger scale urban farms. Uh, in the Navy Yard where I am, we have the largest urban farm in the United States. It's called the Brooklyn Grange. It's 55,000 square feet. And it doesn't grow foods uh, that don't make sense for the space. Uh, that's a double negative. It grows foods that make sense for the space. So you don't need to grow corn and wheat on a rooftop in New York City or even here any, in any city. You can do that elsewhere. But you can grow high yield crops that make sense to have locally and fresh and instantly. Arugula, different mints and herbs and spices, spirulina, these kinds of things mm -hmm. that, uh, that you only want a dash of in your salad, not your whole salad. Mm -hmm. And you can do that locally and have an enormous switch in the impact mm -hmm. for doing something like that. Gro growing crickets for protein saves 2,000 gallons less water than the same gram of protein you get from a cow. Mm -hmm. It's also 300 times less greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. from getting protein, same amino acid structure from a cricket than you would from a cow. Most people don't think they're gonna eat crickets. I, I get it. 80% of the world eats bugs. You did eat bugs today. It's contaminants in your food. So you didn't know that they were there. There's a certain percentage <laughs> that we allow into food products. Yeah. Uh, but if, if we do create a sanity, uh, sanitized process that's hygienic, that's good for those creatures, uh, and that it tastes great, we'll be on board. Yeah. One of the things we did in that housing project, just really quick, is we had a lot of fun mm -hmm. trying to get crickets to reproduce. So we made these uh, cricket brothels, which was a <laughs> fun job for an architect. Uh, but the women give these come hither looks and the men do, they do the straddulation, just chirping. And they chirp and I don't know what's said or if they drink some, then you know, they reproduce and it works great. But that's, that's how we knew our, our shelter was successful because it would literally sing. They were all so happy and chirping and having lots of sex that uh, it, it worked. I feel like Borat, what am I yeah. doing this for? No, so this is, this is uh, <laughs> the title of the talk is Grow in Your Own Home, isn't it? It's, uh, now, is anybody else would like to ask a question? Let me take this young lady here. Um, hi, so my question is from quite early on in the speech when you were talking about using mycelium as a form for like chairs and mm -hmm. other yeah. objects in your home. So surely, if it's edible, like all foods, it would rot at some point. So just in terms of like family heirlooms, like people have passed down objects and chairs mm -hmm. to uh, future generations. How would that be possible in terms of like using mycelium as a material or would that not be possible? Right, well, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Well, essentially, after we're done growing the mycelium, which takes seven days, um, more or less, uh, we petrify it. 
So we apply a little bit of heat at around 180 degrees mm -hmm. and that mushroom becomes basically solid. It's inert, has no allergens. Mm -hmm. It'll stay like that as long as it's not directly exposed to really you know, vicious elements for a long time. It should last almost forever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess that would kind of answer the, the heirloom thing. I've never thought of, though I think it's a great question, about passing the mushroom chair yeah. generations from family member to family member. But that, that's a way to actually achieve you know, uh, sustainability or socio-ecological design, mm -hmm. is design things that are so precious that people love and they don't throw them out. There's a great example that IDEO did with a toothbrush. Mm -hmm. We throw out plastic toothbrushes all the time. This stuff ends up in mm -hmm. our oceans. Uh, it's very difficult to clean up these types of plastics. Mm -hmm. Well, if we made a handle for a toothbrush and a whole system for a toothbrush that was mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful, was bespoke, well-crafted, uh, you would do something unthinkable, which is you would pass that toothbrush down through the generations. Mm -hmm. All you would replace would be the bristles in the front. So you're not brush <laughs> brushing with grandpa's <laughs> teeth at some point. <laughs> But, but you, you can think of, you, just, you can start making things that, that are not designed for obsolescence. Mm -hmm. e almost everything we own is designed for obsolescence. The shoes, shoes that you have are designed for obsolescence, not because they're, they're, they stop being useful as shoes, but because they're no longer cool. Mm -hmm. So it's perceived obsolescence if we don't engineer actual obsolescence. Mm -hmm. I have an iPhone 10 for really no reason. My last iPhone was perfectly fine. I guess the battery was failing, but that was built into the system. This is to keep this economy uh, uh, in a method where we're, we're just consumers all the time. So the idea of things that are heirlooms, I passed down my iPhone for five generations, that's a really good idea. So we should design a system that's modular, that has a switchable fabric, where the CPU and maybe the memory and perhaps the battery get replaced, but the rest of the system uh, is, is, is built to last for a very long time. It's a great attitude. We originally had that attitude. It's just mm -hmm. Kinsey and economy. Much, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's a lady over here. Lots of questions there. Is it what? Lots of questions. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, it seems to me you've been talking about sort of just fresh ways of thinking that are really mm -hmm. for the betterment of the planet and you know everything on the planet and the immediate environment around the planet. Yep. And it, it's wonderful to hear you doing it. I mean, I feel honestly you're better than two gin and tonics because I really feel good <laughs> listening to you and you know, all the, you? The, way, the way you can rise above, you know, we, we get very into grooves of s s stuck in thought about yeah. traffic and housing and our ridiculous health system and you know, all this, we get stuck. So it's lovely to have someone come along and say, you know, you can think about things differently. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, how optimistic it is you're feeling about you know people like yourself who can collaborate and have mm. these thoughts and turn it into design as opposed to people who would have us stay in in older ways of thinking or in, in fact in destructive mm. ways mm. people who you know who are destroying the planet and, and so on yeah so how, how optimistic are you feeling yeah well Frank it's a great question Frank and I were actually we were discussing this mm. earlier I mean, optimism and strong narratives and the human imagination, which is really what we're talking about. Uh, these are absolutely powerful things, especially combined with alcohol. It's, uh, <laughs> this is, this is really good. Um, but you know, on some level though, there's, there's a reality and, and we talk about how these things can be implemented and, and what's, what's the pessimistic side to this system? Why isn't it working? Why, why, why? Um, What's something that would trigger these changes? So there's a, a man by the name of Paul Gilding, who's a former CEO of Greenpeace, and he's one of these advocates for what we call the dark ecology movement, um, mm. which is a, a, basically a bunch of scientists and, and major activists that have sort of given up because they have been discussing this for a very long time. They've been in conversation. They're not preaching, they're in conversation. They listen to ideas, they want to work with people, but they do want to see some kind of optimistic, positive change. And it hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened. So their thought is, um, one of the ways it's definitely gonna happen is if we have a very big, ugly crisis. Mm. And that actually is an excellent instrument to get people motivated, especially our political class, mm. to create change mm. now because the tools are, are really available. Civilization 2.0 could have been rolled out a decade or two ago, but we're just slow to do that. But a, a, 
an ugly crisis. Hopefully it doesn't hurt too many people or hurt anybody, really, I don't want that. But Hurricane Sandy in New York City was a great example. So that happened, it was exactly like everyone said from planning and science. Now if it happens again and we're, we're ill-prepared, we're the fools, shame on us. When it first happened though, we've, we've got a sense that New York just flooded and sea levels are rising, the storms are getting bigger, the surges are getting stronger, and they're more frequent. And these are facts, it's not made up, it's not patterns in weather, it's patterns in climate, much different than weather. We need to defend ourselves against doing this and build a system to stop it. But a, a crisis, honestly, is what's gonna get some kind of change. When we had Pearl Harbor happen in the United States, we had a foreign power invade us and almost wipe out our military power, our Navy power. And that happened overnight, we weren't expecting it. The great thing about that is that we went from a bickering group of angry people on both sides of the aisle to having one voice, shaking hands, and with just a few days, the entire United States was starting to retool itself to fight that power and, and to build an economy that made sense to defend ourselves. So if there is something that's gonna hit Europe or the United States, and it, and it is a big, ugly crisis, uh, we will find that consensus through that, that kind of mutual disaster. It's affecting people in the third, you know, they're, they're crossing the Mediterranean Sea as we speak, and we, you know, we've seen this theme within the, the festival program. Yeah. But, uh, so, and people are drawing up the bridge. So if, it could get ugly. I don't know, I ho I'm hopeful. Yeah, it can, hopeful. can get ugly, but it's happening in, in, in increments there. Yeah. I mean, that's... Uh, um, but we do, we do have the power and the imagination to kind of overcome these things. If people can come together, I think that's what you're... We're, Apparently we're, it's, we're saying it's, we, we believe in the power of reality to, to overcome these. Derek? For one more question. Yeah, for take one, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, very interesting afternoon. Uh, there is a movement in, in, in uh, Europe, the degrowth movement, which mm. is going along what you just last talked about. Um, yeah. You talked earlier about the cycle of change as well. Mm. Uh, the problem we have here in Ireland, and particularly here in Galway, is planning takes so long. and uh, We're working to a plan that was hatched 30 years ago uh, and is still not finished, it's still going on. And that's basically to, to depopulate the city and move people out uh, to the surrounding towns and villages and then expect them to commute back in to where the work is. This was called the Buchanan Plan. And uh, that's where you get your bypass uh, element. So uh, that, that's a 30 year uh, thought process. And that's not gonna change quickly. <laughs> that, that's Agreed. the problem that we're yeah. with, yeah. Uh, uh, and until that changes, which is politics, really, yeah. our politics has to change. I think because regarding time, planning, there's a lady here. You'd like to ask a question as well, just just in front of you there. Thank you. Well, very. It wasn't really a question. Comment. It was just um, yeah. historically, you said that no uh, laws had been made for animals, and actually, a Galway man called uh, Richard Martin, he. That's um, yeah put forward the uh, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals mm, Act that's right. in the British Parliament. Mm. And actually, it was under that act that children got protected. It was for animals, but they said, well, children are animals too, so it's under that act <laughs> that children got protection. Children that's are just animals. the point. Very what what point year was history. that, though? Do you, do you remember? That was, um, any historians here, it would be back uh, Richard. Richard Martin, he lived in uh, a beautiful house. Okay. Well, it would have been back a bit because he was a famous duelist. Yes. Uh, mid 18th to century. To whatever. Yeah. But uh, he was also called Humanity yeah. Dick okay. because of his laws. <laughs> well, I think that's quite a good place to... I want to look into that. That's, that's to, uh, to wind it up, I think. Yeah. We could all take a, a page out of uh, Richard Humanity Dick. Martin's book, and I think that sort of there's a bit of hope in, in that message, perhaps. I want to thank Mitch again for coming to Galway and sharing these really exciting propositions <laughs> with us. Thank 
you to everybody for attending and between the crow for inviting us. Yeah. If you guys are, if you're ever in Brooklyn, please stop by our group. It's in the Brooklyn Navy Yards. Since we're a nonprofit, our doors are always open, and, and folks come in all the time, and it's uh, it's it's great to see people here. Just say we we were we met in Galway or something like that. Yeah. It's fine, you know. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much.